Hey there everyone, how's it going? Now that E3 is finally out of the way, and the flood of new information is finally slowed down a little bit, I figured this would be a pretty good time to put together what we know so far about FromSoft's upcoming Bloodborne. Most of the information in this video is going to be coming from FromSoft or Miyazaki himself. Where there's speculation, I will specify. So, let's jump right into it. Let's start off broadly with what exactly Bloodborne is. Bloodborne is an action RPG with elements of horror and dark fantasy, very much in the vein of Kingsfield or Shadow Tower, or most recently and probably most relevantly, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 2. As you might imagine, it's being developed directly by From Software, and it's being headed by the man himself, Miyazaki. It is not a sequel to the Souls games, but it is being treated as a spiritual successor to Demon Souls. It's also being co-produced with Sony Computer Entertainment Japan, who are collaborating on Bloodborne, and thus it's going to be a PS4 exclusive. They're currently targeting 1080p 30fps. The demo the press saw at E3 was pretty rough as far as frame rate goes, and FromSoft doesn't exactly have a sterling track record with smooth performance, but we're still way off from release, so they could still iron that stuff out. I'm expecting at least a little jank in the final release, either way. So the game began development after the Artorias of the Abyss DLC came out back in 2012. This would seem to lend credence to the theory that Dark Souls 2 was developed by FromSoft's B-Team. And if that's the case, then it looks like the A-Team has been working on Bloodborne since 2012, since early 2012 at that. Alright, now let's talk a little bit about where Bloodborne is going to be taking place and what we know about the world so far. Bloodborne is going to take place in a city known as Yarnum. Not sure if that's the correct pronunciation, haven't heard it pronounced yet. That's the one I'm going to stick with, though. The city looks a little bit like a Victorian London-inspired dark fantasy setting. Very brooding, a lot of gothic architecture. It's going to be an open-world game in the vein of Dark Souls 1, with a lot of variety within the city and, and an emphasis on verticality. It's kind of interesting that FromSoft specified it wouldn't be an open-world like Dark Souls 2 was, but it would be more like 1. So that begs the question of what exactly does that mean? I think and I hope that means we're moving back towards this big interconnected space and not necessarily the procession of loosely connected levels that didn't really feed into each other uh, like what we got in Dark Souls 2. I'm hoping that means that we're going for more of a, a cohesive world like we got in Dark Souls 1. I'm also speculating that this might mean we won't get the same fast travel system as in Dark Souls 2. Either way, they put an emphasis on shortcuts and a lot of other things we did find way more often in Dark Souls 1. Variable weather and time effects are also confirmed to be included in the game, but right now it's not actually known if any of that is dynamic or not. It could be like in previous games where certain levels just have pre-baked effects and lighting and times of day. That's not really known yet. Interestingly, FromSoft made a comparison to Thief when talking about the level design, saying that Yarnum's world is more complex than that of the world of Thief. Finally, Miyazaki emphasized something that gets me so much more jazz than I already was. The Tower of Latria from Demon Souls is their benchmark for what they want to do with the atmosphere of the game. They want to capture that feeling for the entirety of the game. That is a big, ambitious goal to aim for, and I am very eager to see how well they hit that mark. As for the plot, not much is known about it right now. It seems like FromSoft's standard affair. You're afflicted with some sort of unknown disease and your journey to find a cure brings you to the city of Yarnum, rumored to hold the cure, but the city itself has been afflicted with some sort of pandemic. Sounds really interchangeable with a lot of the plot elements from Dark Souls. There's been no talk really beyond that. When Dark Souls 2 came out, one of the directors mentioned 
wanting to shift slightly more towards in your face storytelling, leaving a little bit less to interpretation that didn't really materialize in a super tangible way in Dark Souls 2. It's probably not going to happen here either. Even if that is the plan, nothing has been mentioned, lore or plot-wise, really. So that's more or less just my speculation. Hopefully they keep up their tradition of environmental storytelling, though. Anyway, though, before we get into the combat, there are a couple of things that I want to mention real quick. One comment I've seen quite a bit is that they might be moving away from created characters and character customization and whatnot because we keep seeing the same character in the leaked media and some of the official stuff. But that's always been the way that the Souls games have been presented and marketed. We had Astrava and the fluted armor in Demon Souls, which was kind of like the poster armor for that game. We saw them almost exclusively the uh, characters in uh, the Black Knight and the Elite Knight set from Dark Souls 1, the Faram gear from Dark Souls 2. Character customization is 100% confirmed to be in the game. No worries there. They're estimating the game length will be around the same as the Souls games, which tells us basically nothing, aside from it'll be pretty long, since all three of the Souls games varied pretty wildly in length. Unsurprisingly, the game is going to have online features, but FromSoft wasn't talking about what those are right now. It's reasonable to assume that the online is going to be very similar to the Souls games, with a couple of subtle tweaks as usual. Hopefully no more soul memory. Miyazaki did say they're working on some new stuff and they're looking into how to utilize the share button, and I kind of hope they don't go too gimmicky with it, just because they feel some sense of obligation to use the gimmicky new feature of the new console. A lot of early Vita games suffered from the shoehorning weird mechanics in that dragged the games, the launch games down uh, because they felt the need to flaunt the, the back touchpad. But I have more faith in FromSoft than that. Plus, that's usually something reserved for launch game gimmicks, so probably won't be anything too offensive there. But again, this is all hopes and dreams and speculation. So let's move on to something a little bit more solid. So the biggest change from the Souls games to Bloodborne is that Bloodborne features no shields. None at all. They've taken away the ability to be totally safe while turtling behind a shield. From what it sounds like though, they're still emphasizing strategy in how you approach combat. It just seems like now the aim is to keep the tension and strategy in place while upping the pace of combat. The way they've been phrasing it is they're working towards shifting the player into a more proactive, aggressive role, and they're aiming to keep Bloodborne on par with Demon Souls in terms of difficulty. Now, there is one important caveat in there. Neither blocking nor parrying are gone. You can still block and you can still parry, in addition to rolling, backstepping, and kicking. Since kicking is in the game again, it seems like the Dark Souls 2 guard break move is probably gone, or they might have just merged that with the kick now. Uh, the kick from the first Dark Souls already kind of fulfilled that function, except it wasn't treated as a critical attack back then. Also, this probably doesn't need to be said, but the footage that came out of E3 featured a player who refused to lock on. They did not remove the lock on feature, that's still there. They also introduced some new tools, one of which is speculated to be a sidestep that covers a pretty wide distance, and you can see it happen a little bit in the trailer. Another newly introduced tool is a gun that appears to serve more as a defensive option than anything. It seems like what they're trying to get you to do is to fire off a shot with a gun, stun the enemy with the gunshot, and then either retreat or go in on offense with your other weapon. Uh, from the footage, you can also see the player's torch being used to light enemies on fire. Now, when the leaks first started happening, and we knew this is Project Beast, something everyone picked up on right away was one, the gun, two, the dual wielding, but third, and most importantly, the other weapon in the character's hand appeared to be some combination of a saw and a scythe, a transforming saw scythe. 
turns out that was dead on. It was a saw cleaver. And something that everyone's been worrying about is that the weapon variety might disappear with Bloodborne, leaving you stuck with your the combination of the gun and the transforming saw cleaver. FromSoft came out and confirmed that there are way more weapons in the game and more weapon combinations than that. The official word is there are less weapons overall than in previous games, but the new weapons are going to be pretty much multifaceted. And many of them are going to have that transforming function, so you can set it to certain modes depending on the situation, and there's still going to be plenty of equipment to collect and customize your character with, according to From. Also, weapons are being divided into main and offhand now, so you won't necessarily be able to combine certain things together, which is a restriction I'm a little bit conflicted about, but we'll see how that works out. The transforming weapons idea is one that I'm really anxious to get hands-on time with, though. I want to see how that changes the game and how much variety you can get out of these transforming weapons. And in some of the leaked trailer footage, you can actually see uh, the weapon variety. Not everything falls into that category of gun or something similar to the saw cleaver. Uh, you have a lot of standard returning weapon, uh, weapon types. Finally, the last major gameplay mechanic that we know of right now has to do with your character collecting blood. You collect two types of blood, human and monster blood. You can gain blood from killing enemies, you can suck it from corpses, and you can get it from items. That makes it sound like it might act as a form of currency, although I don't think it's replacing souls completely as the primary form of currency, since you can actually see what looks like the glimmer of souls being collected uh, in some of the footage. None of that is confirmed, though. What we do know is that blood can heal you, and it can provide some other benefits that are not specified right now. According to Miyazaki, your character progressively gets drenched in it, and blood is actually going to be spurting from the areas of the body that you hit. In some of the footage, you can actually see a monster taking a swing to the ankle, and the blood pouring out from there. Pretty morbid, but that's the detail befitting this world. Maybe we'll see a Titch cameo. Probably not, though. This is the key part, though. Collecting too much blood from monsters turns you into a beast, which might be this game's equivalent of going hollow. And the game gets harder in this mode, for reasons, again, we don't know about yet. We don't know the specifics of this beast mode yet. And you need to collect human blood to turn human again. In a Famitsu article, they mention that collecting human blood to turn human again is going to have some major online component associated with it. That kind of makes it sound like it has something to do with PvP. It could just as easily have something to do with co-op, though, similarly to how you would get humanity in Dark Souls for co-oping. Anyway, though, that's basically all we know so far, plus... All of the stuff you can see from the various pieces of official and leaked media. Bloodborne is set to release in spring of 2015. It might be set for March 31st based on a leaked PSN store page. The 31st is a Tuesday, which is when new games typically come out, but March 31st is also the end of the second quarter of the fiscal year, so it's likely a placeholder. Sony's E3 brochure did suggest a release date between January and March, though, so who knows? Spring 2015 is all that's even remotely set in stone right now, and even that could change, but that's all the official word we have to go on is Spring 2015 for Bloodborne. And that is going to be about it for this video. I would gush about the level and the art and the monster designs, but you'll get enough of that from me in due time. And I mean, just look at it. Oh, look at this tentacle monstrosity. Not telling you anything you can't see for yourself, but god damn, this game looks great. Before I go, there is one more vital feature I forgot to mention. The ragdolls are back! Yes! Oh, I can't wait. Can't wait for more corpse soccer. Alright, if you like this and found this video informative, make sure to leave a like, a comment, subscribe, uh, share the video, favorite, spread the word. I swear this call to action grows larger every time I do it. Anyway, make sure to check back on the channel every day for more daily gaming videos. 
and obviously a Bloodborne playthrough when that comes out, and hopefully some extended pre-release coverage in the coming months. Thanks for watching everyone, take it easy, have a good one.